I would like to speak about one of the most famous people in the history of show business, Nathan Birnbaum. Nathan Birnbaum. Born in 1896 in New York City. What, you never heard of Nathan? Come on. Born in 1896 in New York City. He had one dream in life, to be an actor. This is only dream. At the age of seven, he was practicing for an acting career in Baltimore. And he pursued that dream. And he stunk. <laughs> he was terrible. He tried dancing. Oh, hard. He tried singing. Even worse. But then, in 1932, he found that he had an unbelievable talent. And he married her. And her name was Gracie Allen. And from 1932 to 1950, every single week on a one-hour radio show, they captured America. She was hilarious. And anyone who got to hear Gracie Allen and her routine knows exactly what I'm speaking about. And then in 1950, to the surprise of everyone, CBS took it on television, and it worked. Oh, it really worked on TV even better than it worked on radio. And from 1950 to 1958, these two basically owned the airwaves. They were great. Except when Gracie Allen got sick around 1958 and retired, he was back to ground zero. He was 62 years old at the time. He figured career was over. So he did a little bit of stand-up in nightclubs. He went around to college campuses. Nobody knew who he was. He was a relic from the past, and he was quickly forgotten in time. And then comes 1974, when they decided to take Neil Simon's The Sunshine Boys from Broadway to the big screen. Jack Benny was hired to play the role of Al Lewis, an old vaudeville comedian. But Jack Benny in 1974 took ill and passed away from pancreatic cancer. Before he died, he recommended his great friend, Nathan, to take his place. Again, they hardly knew who he was by this point, but he took the role. And oh, did he kill it. My God, did he kill it. He won an Academy Award. And from obscurity, at the age of 79, let me repeat that, from obscurity at the age of 79, he became one of the most famous and recognized actors in the world. And then his career took off at 79. He appeared in three films playing the role, role of God. And those who remember his movie with John Denver, it's an unforgettable movie. He was brilliant. An iconic movie after iconic movie after iconic movie. Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Just You and Me, Kid. 18 again. Going in style. Movie after movie after movie, he became one of the most beloved and recognized figures in the world. And he performed to the age of 100 when he passed away soon after. Of course, long ago, Nathan Birnbaum had changed his name to George, George Burns. It is never too late to be what you might have been. What a lesson. I want to introduce a very special speaker, Leah Dobson. You see, as I started building a clientele, and it got bigger and bigger and bigger, the unfortunate side of that is the law of averages started to catch up. Every year, two to three of my clients passed away. Every year, two or three friends who I had known for 20, 30 years, I knew them intimately with hundreds of hours of phone calls through the years, they would pass. And their children would come to the office. And I would sit there absolutely dumbfounded that their own children had no idea 
but the values and beliefs of their parents even more. I knew they did. They had no idea what their finances were. I knew they didn't. They had no idea of what personal legacy their parents wanted to leave. I did. They did. So when I met Leah Dobkin, who was a writer and historian, a gerontologist, dedicating her life to crafting legacy letters so that people could leave to their children a sense of who they were, what their mission was, what their values and belief was. I consider what she does one of the most untapped sources, not only of revenue, but of goodwill ever, ever conceived. And I guess you could best say about Leah that it's never too late to know who your parents were. Leah Tapia. I am delighted to be here to tell you a little bit about Legacy Letters, my journey, what they are, what they're not, the history, and some interesting applications that I've discovered on this journey. So I am Leah the Legacy Letter Lady. And how did I become Leah the Legacy Letter Lady? Well, since I was 12, I wanted to work with older people. And I became a geriatric social worker, and then I became a journalist. And in 2011, I literally woke up from a dream to help people write legacy letters. And I was so excited. And as Stephen said, legacy letters are letters to your children or grandchildren about your life lessons and family and personal stories and wisdom and expressions of gratitude and blessings that you want to pass on to the next generation. And so I called my editor up at Kiplinger's Retirement Board, and I told her about my dream. It combined my background in aging and my writing skills. And I was so excited. She said, Leah, did you Google it? It's been around a really long time. And I said, no, I didn't know that. So I did. So I Googled it. And I discovered that it was based on a Bible story about Jacob. And on his deathbed, he called his 12 sons to his deathbed, not his daughter, just his 12 sons, to impart his ethics and values and burial instructions. And that was called an ethical will. How many people have heard of it? Anybody? Okay, I didn't either. The first thing I did was a workshop for the cancer center for fellow cancer patients and survivors so they could write a legacy letter. Mm -hmm. And the person who organized it was a young woman pregnant with her future daughter. Mm -hmm. And so she wrote a letter to her future daughter. So anyone around th this table, if you think you have to have gray hair to do a legacy letter, think differently. Because I believe if you have a pulse and you love someone and someone loves you, we all should be writing legacy letters. So it started out doing that. And then my journey continued. I started working one-on-one -on -one with clients, like they were a source for an article, because I was this journalist, and I said, well, why can't I apply the same principles? So I would interview them with a digital recorder. Now you can just use your cell phone. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then have a professional transcriber transcribe the interview, and I asked people provocative questions. And based on their answers and looking at the transcript, I would craft a letter in their voice. And then the, all they had to do was edit it. So it gets done. And initially, my father and my mother were uh, guinea pigs. I used them, and I created their books. Um, I also did a letter to my son and Doug, and realized, wow, this is really fascinating. This process is interesting, and I think it can apply it to a larger group of people. So, um, but what was interesting is six months after my last cycle, um, I had written this letter to my daughter and my son, and 
my daughter never mentioned the letter to me, but she was 16, at, well actually no, she was 18 at the time, and she, um, she started calling me more often, we started doing things with each other more often, and spend more time with each other. And I don't know, mothers and daughters and teenagers, it can be difficult. And so the fact that this letter sort of opened up this, this opportunity to spend more time with each other and have a stronger interest with each other, I was just really delighted. Um, even though I'm Leah the Legacy Letter Lady, and now it's nine years later, I don't think my son has opened up this letter. So my point is this, that even though you think this might be a wonderful idea to do, do it for yourself. Um, I have 100% confidence that this letter will be beneficial to my son at some point in the future. Um, and that's okay that he didn't read the letter. It seems like it, you think about your family, and some people are just more into family history and legacy issues, and others are not. But still, nevertheless, there's always some people that end up embracing it and really benefiting, and you don't know how they're going to benefit. Um, my daughter, um, something else happened. Six months after, you know, I was thrilled about writing her this letter. Six months later, she's 19, and she died. And in a million years, I never expected for her to pass before me. And so when I talk to groups such as yours, I have this sense of knowing the fragility of the life we live, and how important that you and you and you and you and you and you, and you should have written the letter yesterday. And I don't mean to slap on Jewish guilt, but when you listen to my words for the rest of this presentation, and Stephen, can you give me a five minute warning when I need to wrap up? You're doing so well, probably not. Oh. <laughs> um, when, when you do this, there's so many benefits, both spiritual, sacred, emotional, psychological, and even physical, that you don't even realize there's been so much research about reminiscing, which in gerontology we call life review, and to reflect on your life and to make sense of what your life is, what your triumphs have been, what your challenges have been, your turning points in your life, why you made the decisions that you made. So when you sit back and reflect, and it's an important element to a legacy letter to reflect on your life, not that it's necessarily easy, but when you do this, you start healing yourself. You start decluttering your own brain. And you start making sense. So it turns out, what I've discovered is that you end up having a better relationship with yourself. You become a more solid person. So it's a very profound process for you, and equally profound for the person who receives the letter. So it's a win-win. But there's also physical benefits. When you do reminiscing, and when you, as soon as you put paper to pen or fingertips to the keyboard, these amazing physical attributes happen as a result. You can increase your immune system when you do this. You can decrease depression and anxiety. You can reduce arthritis and asthma symptoms. You can increase cognitive ability. And the list goes on and on and on, all these physical benefits from actually doing a legacy letter. So I see it as a wellness tool. What is a legacy letter not? Okay. It's not a memoir. It's not an autobiography. It's not you know, a, a um, oral history, although it has its elements. Because when you look at those um, types of books, basically they talk you about you know, who, what, when, where. When you do a legacy letter, you dig a little deeper and you look at life lessons, why you did things, how you felt at the time, and you unearth these pieces of wisdom from these experiences. So you dig a little bit deeper. So a legacy letter also is not a living will, like an ethical will or an estate plan, although it can be incorporated into estate plans and living wills. Um, I think that's a wonderful combination to think about, is how you can 
make the estate planning process or your developing a living will or a very traditional will into a more sacred experience. And the difference is that a living will or a regular will or an estate plan explains what you want your offspring to have, and a legacy letter explains what you want them to know. And so you can see how they're complementary cousins to each other, and they work beautifully together. So in addition to that, the other thing that they're not is what I wanted to say. This is very important, and Stephen actually helped exemplify this. A legacy letter is not full of oughts and shoulds. If you look at medieval ethical wills, for example, it's all full of oughts and shoulds, and it turns young people off. What a legacy letter does, and what Stevens demonstrated so well today, is the power of storytelling. How it can inform and transform. And so when I interview people like a source for an article for their legacy letter, and we dig deeper, it's all through storytelling. So they may want to express their values, but it's through a story. I'm going to ask you a question, and I just want to take maybe two minutes to write down the answer. If you, theoretically, if you were on the earth and you knew for just 30 days you had all the wealth you can imagine, you had all the health, but all you had was 30 days on the earth, how would you spend those 30 days? Write down the answer. And I'll give you two minutes. Does anybody want to share what they wrote down? I just took a vacation to Hawaii, so I wrote down on a boat sailing around the Hawaiian Islands. Sailing around the Hawaiian Adventure. Anyone else? Love for nature and scenery and the outdoors. Right. So if I asked you what is your value, those values may have not come up. But through thinking through a provocative question, you are already, do you agree with those three? Yeah. yeah. Three values. So should you choose, when you go home tonight, mm -hmm. take those three values Think of stories that actually help illustrate what you've done in your life that demonstrate those three values. So that's how it works. You ask provocative questions, you dig a little deeper, and then you link stories with it. So most of these um, legacy letters, I would say, average about two or 3,000 words. Uh, some are books, very large books. Some are small. Um, some people feel intimidated by the process, thinking it's too large of a project. And just to show you that it doesn't have to be a large project, I'm going to read you a legacy letter that's just one paragraph. So this is a mother to her children. Dear ones, can everybody hear me pretty good yes. without the microphone? Yes. I fully expect that I will live for a very long time to see you well into adulthood and to share your future with this is much, to, there is much to look forward to, and I am planning on being part of all the adventures, and all the challenges, and all the joys. But, if for some reason I am not, the most important thing you need to know is how much my love for you creates the person that you will remember as me. I made you, but you made me too. I am so proud of you and so grateful to you. When the time comes, and none of us can answer the question of when that will be, you need to know that without a doubt, I was fulfilled in my life. I have a wonderful life, and I don't want you to mourn me, maybe a little. 
but not too long. Carry me forward by recreating the net that I was for you and be it for others. Carry me forward in your kitchen with our favorite coffee cake, muffins, and pies warm from the oven and made from your own delectable pleasure. Or for those who care about it, carry me forward with an optimistic outlook and tenacious devotion to what you know is best. Carry me forward and I will be with you always. Mother of Jesus, protect you. Okay, so one paragraph. And a lot of these, these legacy letter books have people's recipes in there. They have favorite lyrics of, of songs. They have favorite uh, poetry and art, even their own art and poetry. So each book is completely different. And so I look at 2019 and think how important even though this is a 3,500-year-old tradition, how important it is for us to do it now. In modern society, when we spend so much emphasis on material things, it's so easy to forget what is important. And the focus of having legacy letters strengthen intergenerational ties is particularly relevant for now. For the last time, you may have sat down with younger people Everyone is plugged into their own electronics and they're not paying attention and stories are not being exchanged like they used to. People are more likely across, living across the country than across the street. And the combination of all the salts on material things and helping us not focus on what's important makes the whole idea of sharing the legacy letter more important to the youth. Um, Maureen Dowd, who's a columnist in the New York Times, said, planning the future without knowing the past is like cutting, is like planting cut flowers. And so one way of, you know, benefit of doing legacy letters is to provide these stronger family roots for younger people and to help them understand their heritage. Um, some researchers, Dr. Duke and Bibish, have done this, this research on how much children know about their families. They created a do you know scale and it was one of the strongest indicators of emotional health was how much a child knows about their family heritage. But here's the interesting thing. It benefits younger people, but at the same time, our society is aging, and we are living longer. And in fact, probably half of all those people, all those humans who turn 65 are living on the earth right now. So I like to think that because we're on the earth longer, that we're not just aging, we're saving. There's even a book called that. That we have all internal sages inside of us if we just spend some time reflecting and understanding and, and experiencing and figuring out what we've learned that we can share with the youth because I think they need it more than ever before. Common sense isn't as common as you think and there's so much skepticism around that it's an infusion of hope and aspiration and expressing to them how you overcame obstacles in your life, how you overcame challenges, can be so helpful, almost like a road map for their life. And as I said, my son never read my letter, but there's gonna be some day where you know, he'll read that letter when he's you know, going through a hard time, and I'm hoping that I'm not just aging, that I'm also saging. But saging is almost like a, almost like a new developmental step for growing older, a more positive step where you become spiritually vibrant and physically vital and socially responsible, not just this image of elders and decay, right? I mean, there's a lot of negativity, a lot of ageism in our culture, but this whole idea of saging, of imparting your wisdom to the youth when they need it the most and you're here the longest with the most experiences, doesn't it make sense bringing us all together? But you do it all through storytelling. 
So what I want to do is to sort of tell about the process and tell you about the applications that I've discovered as a result. These are, uh, I started out just doing letters and then I put them in this book, so I'm going to pass them around. So this. Leah, Leah, Leah. Leah. Okay. So here are some books of traditional legacy letters. This is a 100 year old woman. This gentleman was 90. He was in World War II and for 70 years he never told the story until I interviewed him. Not to his son, not to his wife. And he started out as a trickle and ended up like a fire hose. And so not all of those stories are in there. So the process itself can be therapeutic and you decide what goes into it. So what happened very quickly, we have two minutes left, is that I came up with this traditional legacy letter and discovered that you don't have to just do traditional legacy letters where an older person writes to a younger person. You could do a younger person to an older person, which I call tribute letters. And so you could talk about what legacy you have received from somebody. And so more recently I've been doing spouses where if you have a 30th wedding anniversary, you can write a letter to your spouse about what they mean to you. Or someone important in your organization, or a volunteer. It could be a nonprofit, a business. Um, this book was uh, a tribute letter for, from, uh, who had commissioned the book was his wife for his 70th birthday. And I collected stories from 30 people about what legacy they received from this man. And then I also realized that because of my daughter, Hannah Rose, I thought, you know, why can't we do these honor your angel legacy letters? So I started doing those. So this gentleman passed away from pancreatic cancer, and I interviewed about 30 of his friends and relatives for his six-year-old son about what legacy they received. And on the first Father's Day that he didn't have his dad, his mother gave him this book with all these letters. So there's applications galore. I work with nonprofits and foundations and businesses, do business histories through storytelling and through legacy building. Um, for example, just one example is uh, working with a foundation when there's a legacy society. You can do these specialty letters focusing on generosity and philanthropy. I work with estate planners. So when somebody does a a, a gift, like a, um, a land gift, for example, they get a free legacy letter from Leah that focuses on generosity, what issues are important to them, and why it should be important to their children. So very quickly, um, it's been an amazing journey. It redefined wealth in this country as not just what you earn in your life, but perhaps what you've learned maybe equally as important, that you don't pass on your values, not just your valuables. And I imagine what the world is like if more and more people did this, whether it's through workshops or classes or one-on-one -on -one or doing it yourself. There's resources at LegacyLetter.org that you can go to and can give you some inspiration on how to do this. But I imagine what the world would be like Nothing was left unsaid between loved ones and really important stories were never forgotten. What would it be like if there were just more love letters in the world?